So we are going to be talking about justice today, and this is going to be a two-part. I think it's this week and next week. And this was something where we started getting into this over the last year, particularly Helen. Helen did a lot of research. And when we were asked to present both on injustice and justice happening in the world, as well as what the Bible says about that, we kind of didn't know how to start. So what we ended up doing is, we're going to take you through what we did, is we started by going through all the verses in the Bible that talked about justice. We are not going to go through all the hundred and some verses that we found. Um, but we're going to go through some highlights and help you guys also get a picture that really stood out to us of how much God has a heart for justice. And then Helen's going to come up and share some of, the, some of her research. She's going to share the real world injustice that's happening both in Canada and abroad. And that's going to be some heavy stuff. Um, but then we're going to look into the roots of that injustice and also what God's doing about that. And this was an, this will part of the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at another piece that came out when we were going through the scripture references on justice is we noticed that there was a sort of lineage of justice being associated with different people of God's chosen people executing justice. And it does include us at a certain point. Then what's going to happen um, next week is we're going to look in more detail of how can we be just and also some helpful pointers on seeking justice. How can we avoid certain pitfalls that seeking justice you may fall into? And we're also going to look into during that time a lot of stories that Helen encountered, both of us encountered from reading, Helen found from the fundraiser hike that she was on for seeking justice and hopefully we'll be encouraged by that because we want us to have a attitude of hope going through the justice and injustice we see, not one of discouragement. So before we do, I'm going to speak a little bit about the term Yahweh and why, are, why am I bringing this up? Well, it's because in scripture there are two different occurrences of the word Lord. One is Lord, and the other is the Lord. Lord is lowercase when it appears in your Bible, and it refers to the Hebrew word Adonai, which means master or Lord, like the Lord of the land. But if it's all capitalized, like the Lord, it's the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is actually God's personal name. So why is this important? When we go through these verses on justice, if we encounter the word the Lord, we have just replaced it with the word Yahweh. And there are two reasons for that. One, it's more accurate. But then the second reason is when we're talking about justice, we want to emphasize the personal nature God has when we're talking about justice. So why are we using Yahweh? It's personal. So let's look at God's heart for justice. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of Yahweh. You'll notice that the words justice and righteousness will often go together when we go through these scripture references. And justice will be an important and integral part of walking with God. We saw this earlier. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. This is how God operates in his ruling. The works of his hands are truth and justice. All his precepts are sure. Everything God does is just. So if we want to know what justice is, we should look at what God has done. Because all things are from God, justice is defined by what God does. Therefore, Yahweh waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he is on high to have compassion on you. For Yahweh is a God of justice. How blessed are those who wait for him. Notice here, when we talk about God's justice, it's mixed with graciousness and compassion. 
It's not just a list of following rules. It's a warm justice, not a cold, you've done something wrong, you're going to be punished. God actually cares, not just about those he's executing justice for, but also those he's executing justice against. Let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am Yahweh, who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares Yahweh. Again, justice and righteousness go with loving kindness. It's that warm justice piece again. And this is what God delights in. So we can take an application from that. If you want to bring God joy, go after loving kindness, justice, and righteousness. To do righteousness and justice is desired by Yahweh more than sacrifice. There are many ways we try to serve God. We might, it might be worship, it might be evangelism, um, learning about him. These are all things that require effort on our part and might be a sacrifice of our time. But have we properly prioritized emulating God's character of justice in our lives? How blessed are those who keep justice, who practice righteousness at all times. This should be exciting. There is a blessing for you when you're practicing righteousness and justice. He executes justice for the orphan, for the widow, and shows his love for the stranger by giving him food and clothing. What's the common thread between these three people, the orphan, the widow, and the stranger? God is emphasizing justice for those who can easily be taken advantage of. All these three people are typically those who are not in a position of power. If you're well off, you're generally not as concerned about injustice being propagated against you because you're well off. You have power, you, you can deal with the situation. But it's those who don't have access, who aren't as well off, those are the people that are at risk and those are the people that God is extra concerned about. He cares about everyone, but he's extra concerned about the vulnerable. Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. Yahweh sets the prisoners free. So God's justice includes delivering those in bondage, bringing justice to the oppressed, and also feeding the hungry. That one we might not typically think of being included as justice. But this is God's warm justice again. He's not just interested in checking the box and making sure someone has their legal rights enforced. He's also caring about people's needs. For I, Yahweh, love justice. Being after God's heart involves seeking justice. But unfortunately, we live in a world that does not focus on justice. And Helen is going to dive more into that and share some of her findings about justice and injustice in Canada and abroad. Thank you, Brooke. So this came about when my sister-in-law asked me at the start of the year to participate in a fundraiser hike with her. It was a hike to support organizations that are working to end sex trafficking. So that kind of catapulted me into a lot of research on what is this problem, what's the prevalence of it in the world and in Canada, uh, and also what can we do about it. And some of you will remember that we did a fundraiser in July, a month and a bit ago now, where I shared a little bit of what I learned uh, and we raised funds together. And that's sort of how this presentation came about is we were asked to repeat it and expand upon it a little. So I will be sharing just a snippet of what I shared during the seminar portion of that fundraiser. There is more, so if you're interested in learning more, please do come see me later and I can share with you some of the podcasts and the books and the articles that I read that gave me a better understanding of what's happening in the world. Uh, and that can fuel our prayer, it can fuel just our perspective uh, and how we go about having God's heart for the things that we need to be aware about. 
So I want to start a little bit more broadly and talk about human trafficking because that's the umbrella under which sex trafficking happens. Human trafficking refers to the recruitment, transportation, harbor, or receipt of people. And what's involved in that is often things like force or fraud or deception. And it's always for the aim of exploitation. That could be personal and physical, as in the case of sex trafficking. But in a lot of the times, it's financial. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in a slide or two. Broadly speaking, there are two main types of human trafficking. The first, uh, as I mentioned, is sex trafficking. The second is labor trafficking. So that's when people are being trafficked for labor. So things like working in factories, uh, when people are um, taken and abused just for the work that they can produce often for hours and hours a day. Uh, so those are the two kind of big buckets under which human trafficking falls. Uh, and for the rest of this presentation, we'll focus a little bit more on sex trafficking. So what does this look like globally? What is actually the scale of this issue? I think most of us have probably heard about it uh, at some point in our lives, but a lot of the times we haven't been aware of the magnitude of the problem. So at the moment, there are 49 million people trapped in what is called modern day slavery, and that would encompass any form of human trafficking. That's more than the entire population of Canada, just to put that number into perspective. Uh, six million of those 49 million are trapped in commercial sexual exploitation, and of those six million, about two million of them are children. And overall, while women are trafficked more than men among children, boys and girls are actually trafficked at equal rates, which is not something that we're aware of a lot of the time. There's less awareness and also resources available for boys and men. So that's certainly a space where some work needs to be done, not just for awareness, but also uh, recovery and prevention efforts too. And I mentioned finances. Uh, every year, $150 billion is generated by human trafficking. So scripture talks about money being the root of all sorts of evil. It really is. There are incredible lengths that people will go to uh, in injustice to make a financial profit. This is another big number that I could hardly wrap my mind around, but what helped me a little bit is when I heard that this means that sex trafficking is actually more profitable than, I don't even know what some of these are, but all of the major sports leagues combined. Uh, so this is a huge, huge issue, and it's also a reason why it's growing, because unfortunately, it is profitable. At this point, it has eclipsed the illegal arms trade in terms of the profits that are made of sex trafficking. Uh, I think I skipped the point a couple slides ago, but two-thirds of the profit that is made from human trafficking comes from sex trafficking, even though it's only six million, six million out of the 49 million people who are being trafficked, it's the majority of the profit. So it's by far the most financially profitable for people, and that's part of what Satan has used to get people to engage in these twisted and evil practices because of the love of money and the sin that is in our hearts. Lest we think that this is just a global problem, I want to take a moment to raise some awareness about the fact that this is something that actually happens in our own backyard as well. A lot of the times we hear about national level injustices and we think that that happens overseas uh, or in third world countries, but not here in Canada, not in our own backyard, maybe a couple blocks down from us. Uh, but it is something that is an issue here, and that's perhaps something that we, as citizens and neighbors of people that we pass on the streets, need to be even more aware of. Canada is a source, transit, and destination country for sex trafficking victims, and that means that people originate in Canada and are trafficked around Canada. There's corridors, is what they're referred to as for human trafficking, that go along the 401 and also Trans-Canada. Um, but then sometimes people are also brought in from other countries or trafficked outside of Canada. For the most part, though, it's people who are born in Canada. 93% of people who are trafficked in Canada are actually from Canada. So this is a local problem as well. 
And a really important thing to be aware of is that 50% of the people who are trafficked in Canada are Indigenous, even though Indigenous people only account for 5% of the Canadian population. So there is a huge disparity here in the risk and also the target that has been placed on this vulnerable community. And so that is an area where we need to come alongside our neighbors who are in need um, and support them and be aware and also be ready to just listen and be a safe space where people can share and find a friend where they are able to disclose that information. I'm gonna talk about that. Um, okay, and I want to finish, this was a new thing that I learned this year. I want to finish by speaking a little bit about something that's called OSEC. It stands for the Online Sexual Exploitation of Children, and this is currently the fastest growing type of human trafficking because of all of the growth that's happened in the remote and the online space. So what OSEC is, is it's the live stream of sexual exploitation rather than people being trafficked geographically speaking. It's actually happening over the internet via sometimes things like Facebook, Snapchat, Skype. These are platforms we're familiar with, also others that uh, are involved in the space. Uh, and the really sad thing is that the people who are able to produce this content are trusted adults of, in this case, because it's children. Children, so it's parents and extended family or neighbors who will engage in this because they receive, again, a profit online. There's e-transfer that happens. Uh, so some of you will remember from the fundraiser that we did a couple weeks ago, we had Brian Mullins with us, uh, who works for the International Justice Mission, IJM. And he shared that if you go to a place like the Philippines, you actually won't see kids for sale on the street anymore. And that's a huge win. But because of the rise and availability of OSEC, that means that abuse is still happening. It's just behind closed doors now. So IJM did a study in 2022 in the Philippines, and they found that nearly half a million children had been trafficked to produce new sexual content online. So that's not stuff that's circulating that year. It's stuff that had been produced for the first time live that year. That meant that one in 100 children were abused during that year. Uh, and nearly one in a thousand adults were a part of that. Uh, so this is a growing issue and it happens overseas, but like I said, this is a problem here as well. Uh, and it's something that we need to be aware of and just especially with the children in our lives, uh, making sure that in age appropriate ways they too are aware uh, and we can be a part of the relationships that vulnerable people have who will have God's heart and be working with them and taking the time to come alongside them on whatever journey it is they're on. That's a lot of the time how God works is not on that big scale, but in a relational way, in a warm way, through the love and compassion and the loving kindness that he has, then executing that in uh, a manner that works for his justice. Thanks, Helen. Yep, okay, it's good, it's working. So there's a lot there. And if you're experiencing sort of what we encountered when we first heard about some of the level of injustice, it was a bit overwhelming. It's like, okay, there's so much here. What, what, where do we start? It's almost easier to hide. But that's usually from an attitude of hopelessness where we lose sight of the justice that God is going to do. So my prayer for us is, God, help us to keep our eyes on you so that we would not be discouraged by the storms in life. I mentioned uh, earlier that one of our findings when we went through scripture was a lineage of God's chosen executing justice. And part of this um, line, uh, which will, will be a timeline actually, is we'll see how injustice came about, what God will do with it, and how he is accomplishing that. So originally, when God created the world, 
He saw that he made and was very good. There was no sin, there was no death. So that means there would also be no injustice, which is a type of sin. However, it didn't stay that way. There was the fall. And Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command, and because of their disobedience, sin entered the world and death through sin. And so now that there's sin and death, we're also going to be seeing injustice in the world. But who instigated it? Well, we're told it was the serpent of old who deceived the woman. It says, the serpent of old who is the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Satan is actively working to steal, kill, and destroy, and deceive, and result in injustice. So, that's where injustice comes from. We have injustice on the earth now. But how is God going to bring about justice? He's got a plan. And it starts with Abraham. The very first time the word justice appears in the Bible, it is with regard to Abraham. And God speaks of Abraham saying, I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of Yahweh by doing righteousness and justice. So Abraham and his descendants have been charged with keeping God's way by doing justice. So Abraham and his seed, this is going to be a hallmark of what they do. The next person that this really shows up in is actually David, of, who's called a man after God's own heart. It says when he was ruling Israel, he reigned over Israel, and David was doing justice and righteousness for all his people. No wonder David is called a man after God's own heart, because he's seeking after the justice that God loved. The lineage continues with David's direct son, Solomon. Solomon, God appears to him in the night and says, ask me what I shall give you. Solomon's response is, give your servant a hearing heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. Solomon's like, I don't know how to properly execute justice in governing this nation. Like, please give me that ability to do justice. God was very pleased that Solomon asked for this, and he gave him that. But what happens after Solomon? The justice line, line continues, and it actually continues with Jesus. Scripture says of Jesus that his government will be one of justice. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. Question, is this happening now? Do we see the full justice executed? No, we don't yet. And this is actually a question the disciples had for Jesus after he resurrected. They're like, okay, uh, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Is this when you're going to sit on David's throne and bring justice to the whole nation? What's Jesus' response? It's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Not a direct answer to the question, but he, he does make it clear it's not now. But, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. So this tells us something. Full justice hasn't been executed yet. It will, but not yet. But until then, we are God's children. We're part of that uh, seed of Abraham, believing him through faith. But we're, and we're also Christ's witness, who has got a heart for justice. So if that's the case, then we, as believers in Jesus, are carrying on that lineage of justice as God's children. This is part of what God has called us to do as followers of Jesus. So we have this hope that Jesus is going to bring justice, but when is it going to happen? 
First, we know Christ is going to do it. He says, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights, I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations, all the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice nor make his voice heard in the street. And I do want to take an aside here because notice the method in which Christ achieves this. It's not he's protesting loudly for justice. He is calling for it and he will bring it about and he's talking about it but he's not raising a ruckus about it and so that if we're wanting to emulate his character and pattern we should take that into account when we try to seek justice ourselves a bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish he will faithfully bring forth justice look at christ's gentleness in bringing about justice for what is weak. Again, we're seeing that warm justice. There's a care in how he executes justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed, no matter how bad the evil is, until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. We are waiting for Christ's justice. We're seeking it ourselves, but we are waiting for his justice. And that will be accomplished when Christ comes again. We're told that Christ will fully bring justice and recompense to evil deeds when Christ returns. With righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Revelation talks about God doing this. There will be judgment on the unjust. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the level. Then hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters will overflow the secret place. There are a lot of people who get away with injustice. But they won't remain hidden from Christ. God will find them. God will judge them. It may not happen right away, but God will repay. And what's going to happen to those who commit injustice and to the devil who's deceived them? We're told in a separate verse for those who commit injustice, but for the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. Christ will fully execute justice. So what should our response be? The exercise of justice is joy for the righteous, but is terror to the workers of iniquity. So I want to take a step back here and allow us to examine ourselves. We've just seen what Christ is going to do. Does that give you joy? And if not, why? Is, it says it's a terror to the workers of iniquity. Is there sin in our lives that we need to examine and confess before God and lay it before him so that this would be a joy to us and not a terror? Because he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we confess it. We're also told if we're seeking to understand justice, evil men don't understand it. But those who seek Yahweh understand all things. So, if you want to understand justice, you should seek Yahweh. He is the one from whom we understand what justice is. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Again, we see the advocacy that's happening. But what we don't see happening is a type of Hollywood justice. We're not going out as a vigilante, basically exacting revenge. God says, vengeance is mine, not mine, his. I will repay. Again, not me, him. Um, he's doing that. We are supposed to protect those people, but not go out and attack everybody. That's, that's in God's hands. But we are supposed to reprove those who commit wrongs. So that's where we're going to leave off for now. But next week, is it next week? Yeah, it is next week. Um, we're going to go into more detail on what scripture tells us about how we can be just. We're also going to look at 
um, different uh, strategies the Bible gives us on addressing injustice. He does give us strategies to handle certain issues and as well as pitfalls that we can avoid. We're also going to go through a lot of stories. Helen's going to share more of the stories that she learned and both of us learned as we learned about justice over this past year. But let's first pray. Thank you, God, that you are a God of justice and that you love it and that you're not just someone who executes justice, but you're a God of loves who cares. We have a God of justice and a God of love so that way we could be saved. If you were just just, we'd be swept away. But because you love us, you devised a just way for sinners to be brought back into reconciliation with you. May we seek you and your character be in turn reflected and your son live through us so that we would show justice to the nations because we're shining you. In Jesus' name, amen. I also just want to... Thanks, guys. Um, I want to hop in and clarify that the stories that we'll be sharing next week are stories of hope. Um, we kind of chop this in half, and the first part is there's some real darkness happening in the world, um, but I want to encourage you that there are also stories of some really incredible good things that good people, because there is a good God, are doing, and that's what we'll be sharing next week. Um, and I also just want to say that if this is something that has hit you in a difficult way and you need to talk to someone or pray with someone or if you yourself are in a situation that you need to talk about or you know someone, there are people here who care. Uh, and so if you want to come speak to us or to Gord or the elders after the service, uh, we don't want anyone to leave here feeling like they are burdened with things that are too big for them. There is a big God who cares about you and that's what he's put the church here for as well. Um, so if that needs to happen, we, we want to invite you with open arms and say uh, there are lots of people here who would love to walk with you through whatever conversation or journey you might be on regarding some of these things.